Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to um, continue the session. So, um, welcome, everyone, again. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, um, depending on where you are. Uh, this session is a session two uh, of the third OECD roundtable on the circular economy, cities, and regions. My name is Tadashi Matsumoto. Um, I'm honored and have a pleasure to moderate this session today. Um, welcome uh, to uh, Professor Webster and, and all the uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, participants, um, very much well attended uh, our webinar, very happy. Um, continue to use uh, the chat function to, uh, to say um, uh, who you are and uh, where you are joining us from. Before officially starting, allow me to remind you that uh, uh, we are recording the webinar. Uh, which will be available at the OECD website in a few days. Um, and then you're invited to ask uh, any questions uh, you may have to the panelists um, using Zoom uh, Q&A function. Um, as Oriana mentioned, this session uh, will be run uh, in English only. So I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Ken uh, Webster, uh, director of uh, International Society for Circular Economy and the visiting fellow at uh, Cranfield University. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor uh, Webster. Uh, we, uh, uh, you have uh, 10 minutes and the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, I think the slides uh, are being controlled from your side or from the organizer's side. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And if I've only got 10 minutes, I suppose I better push on. People who don't know me perhaps might have heard of the Alan MacArthur Foundation, which, uh, for, which I was head of innovation for eight years. And I spend my time between academic work and practical work. And I was asked to say something about systems. And uh, it was prompted in a way by the thought from Einstein who said, the theory determines what you observe. No, we don't see the world as it is. We filter it through perceptions, which depend upon our worldview. And this could be really quite helpful when we're, when we're designing uh, functioning circular economy systems. And I just want to leap back on slide one to very typical uh, one slide about the circular economy based on cradle to cradle work and you've got the problem and you've got a possible solution. I've already added one thing in there that isn't generally discussed, which is the role of uh, money and credit. And uh, some people believe it's endogenous, not exogenous. But the main shift in perception is that the circular economy takes insights from living systems. All of the early writers, uh, Brown Goddard McDonough, Janine Benyus, uh, Gunter Pauli, they all made that point that it uses for its inspiration living systems. And even when we're talking about materials, uh, cradle to cradle folks always talk about nutrients, not about materials, but there are nutrients for the system. In other words, waste is food, which was always, to me early on, a very sharp observation that we're thinking about it differently. Oh, we're not talking about waste. We're talking about food for the system. We're also not talking about fossil fuels, we're talking about efficiency in energy, but also renewables as dominant. And we're talking about stock maintenance. We're not degenerating capitals, we're rebuilding them. So it's a very different perspective systemically. But we can take that a lot further. It might be interesting. Next slide. Please. The next slide, please. Just one second. There we are. Thank you very much. Um, Brown got Madonna talked very much about effective systems. They said we don't want just efficiency, we want effectiveness. Why did they say that? Well, 
real life systems like here we have the lungs they're not just they're not even efficient in that sense they're effective at doing a job the only efficient bit are the big channels there you can see but the real work of the lungs is done by all the small channels all the small exchange opportunities at the, at the end of the at the end of the system that's where the work is done and this talks about a system's purpose now if you're looking at living systems they all seem to have this characteristic in in them which is that they go for effectiveness which efficiency supports gunter Pauli went as far as to say that our current obsession with lowering costs is a it's a misdirection what we need to do if we're looking at the system as a whole is to add value with what we have now most resources are pretty local or regional what can we do with those that adds value not how do we reduce using everything uh, nature doesn't work that way uh, if you look at a forest it's full of stuff moving around uh, nobody says they should minimize it you know if you see the blossoms on the tree in april and may you're not saying look at all that waste it only takes one of these to get a, a cherry or whatever to reproduce the tree you don't say that it's about abundance but abundance as a food system let's let's abstract that a little bit next slide please What I'm trying to do is say that there are lessons in this for how we might do policy. I'll get right down to that in a moment. Let's aggregate what we know from what's called information theory. What do all of these sort of systems have in common to make them effective? Now, if you look at real life ecosystems, there are always an interplay between efficiency on one hand and resilience on the other hand. And that's how they end up being both flexible, adaptable, capable of evolution. They don't go for more and more efficiency because efficiency has no purpose. It's only a relationship between input and output. What we want to design are effective circular economy systems. Let's go into this a little bit more. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It's a bit slow, but it's coming. Okay. Purchase of a faster machine looks like an, an aid to effectiveness here. But I will, I will talk uh, over this anyway. It should be there. There we go. Now, just to use an analogy, we have this contrast between what we generally look at, which is efficiency. This is about reducing the number of connections maximum volume if you like and by analogy it's a bit like the trunk of the tree or the main roots but where most of the action in the economy happens or in the tree is in the surface the exchange function i call it and others do or in the roots in other words the main structures are there to support the periphery not the other way around yet when we think of economies we focus too much I would say on the flow, the core element, which is flows and not enough about building the opportunity for exchange at local and regional levels. And that is, needs quite a deliberate response. Next slide, please. Right, so we have perhaps an underdeveloped resilience within economies in terms of a circular economy because we've been ignoring it now many of these will be familiar but because none of these businesses are large enough to have a lot of capital these are marginal businesses they're very competitive and collaborative they need help it's an exchange function if you're looking at living systems they're very uh, able to take damage they can recreate themselves but they're not big firms uh, by analogy with capital and so things like temporary materials stores why let stuff go through a city it may be efficient to deal with the material but it doesn't provide a buffer for people to access that material and do something with it 
building training, building opportunities like community kitchens or fabrication labs. Yeah, Barcelona is quite well known for its Pablo New district in terms of building uh, infrastructure which encourages production and exchange. Local currencies, city banks, all of these things help at very low cost, and they have to be low cost, help people get involved and participate in the economy using what's around them. Next slide, please. But um, talking about um, the, uh, what you need in, in terms of enabling conditions to help support this resilient side of the economy means also looking at the macro level as well. And um, I hope that slide's ready now. The macro level of the economy means uh, adjusting how we uh, spend and tax. And I put it that way around because I'm a big fan of modern monetary theory and probably get me no friends here. However, the economy is, well, is badly adjusted to, to create uh, the systemic approach to circularity because macro flows of expenditure and income need to be deliberately orientated for circularity and exchange. At the moment, they're orientated towards asset values, non-productive assets. And yet business needs customers and customers need income. In fact, I would uh, invoke Adam Smith in my defense. He said the problem to get, he wanted to get the great circulation. The problem was the landlord. The problem was the rentier. And in fact, all classical economists up until the end of the 19th century said the problem was uh, rent seeking by landlords and others. And so he wanted a more competitive market. We seem to be in a similar position now, only with monopolies and oligopolies um, extracting the economic rents. So we want to encourage people to be part of this exchange economy, to use materials and resources which are available. So why do we tax them so much? Why don't we tax non-renewables or non-productive assets? In other words, we focus our attention on encouraging circulation, production and exchange, not an asset economy. Maybe, and these ideas are pretty common now, things like the job guarantee or a basic dividend and infrastructure spending to, to create the sorts of infrastructure we've been talking about for, uh, for a while now in terms of low carbon economy and so on. And most importantly, if we can create an economy that thrives at its base, which uses what's around it, taps multiple cash flows and adds value, it will help with that uh, notion of populism. It will help defend and rework uh, democracy and it will involve probably changing the monetary system around. So you can't just do circular economy as a bolt on to the economy you've got now because you'll end up with something quite uncomfortable. Last slide here. So what sort of economy is emerging? I would say that um, there's plenty of evidence that we've got two sorts of circular economy emerging. And I've argued for the one on the right to get a lot more support, if we want to say it, to have enabling conditions to make it happen. At the moment, we're getting centralized circularity. We might get zero waste. We might get products to services, but it's often top down. It's in-house. Uh, it's full of proprietary IP intellectual property, and it's about controlling materials or controlling platforms for exchange. Whereas on the other side, picking up more on how nature actually works, if you're talking about living systems, is stuff about open standards, open source, open data, it's distributed R&D, it's, it's designed globally, manufactured locally, and it is about a knowledge commons where people can participate more in the economy. Now, to make it come together, we know that living systems are effective uh, and they answer for us here maybe that we have to have both of these sort of approaches, but we need to remember that the resilience part, the distributed part is every bit as important, if not more important than the centralized control flow of uh, products, components and materials. And I'd like to leave you with that as a sort of reflection on systems thinking, which everybody talks about, but nobody really explores in this sort of way about what is or what are the conditions for an effective system. Thank you very much. Uh, as I say, once again, for the invitation to be able to talk about systems. Thank you, Professor. 
web search, uh, for reminding us the importance of the systems approach, system thinking, with with, uh, with some concrete uh, uh, interpretation of it, uh, importance of uh, of exchange, uh, importance of also promoting the uh, non uh, uh, pr productive asset and and the taxing and um, uh, in, uh, to the uh, non productive asset. Um, and importance of resilience. It, it, it's really uh, uh, key points are, are, are really uh, reminded uh, in uh, our, our presentation. Um, so we are going to uh, continue the agenda, but please uh, don't hesitate to share questions uh, to, uh, to a professor and then also uh, comments. So we are trying to address them during the discussion and, and in the chat. Now I will pass uh, the floor to uh, my colleague uh, Ander Ezagire, the, the junior policy analyst at the OECD for spotlight on one of the case studies of the OECD program of the uh, uh, circular economy in cities and regions, uh, the case study of uh, city of Glasgow, the, the host of the next COP26. So Ander, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Tadashi, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to, to share the preliminary findings on, of the ongoing policy dialogue with the city of Glasgow as a case study of the OECD program on the circular economy in cities and regions. The city of Glasgow, since the beginning of this dialogue, has committed, has been committed to transition towards the circular economy as a means to improve not only environmental conditions in the city, but also social and living conditions of its citizens. So if we move to the next slide, please. In my brief presentation, I would like to focus on three main aspects of, 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 the, of the circular transition in the city. The why, the what, and the how of the circular transition for Glasgow. Regarding the why, uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, one of the one of the one of the main reasons is to face an increasing demand of infrastructure and services as a consequence of population growth. The city of the city of Glasgow can apply uh, circular economy principles to the increasing demand of infrastructure and services, given that the population growth will demand. 25,000 new houses between 2015 and 2025. Uh, in this sense, there are many ways to make the building, the building construction more circular, for example, using recycling material to looking at the whole uh, life cycle of the building. So uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, a second option is to apply circular economy principles aiming at preventing waste and transforming waste into resources to allow the city reach the goal to become the first carbon neutral city in the UK by 2030. Already the city show commitment in this regard as uh, emissions dropped by 37% in 2018 from 2006 level and Glasgow was also the first Scottish city to introduce a low emission zone in, in the city center. And the third reason, if we move to the next slide, uh, and another reason is to apply circular economy principles to regenerate polluted land and improve health conditions as 55% of population in Glasgow live within 500 meters of a derelict site, which is double the share uh, of Scotland. And there are many applications for achieving it, uh, such as the experimentation with the smart grid solutions and also the construction of sustainable buildings. So if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, the what refers to the work Glasgow has been doing so far. And we can see that the circular economy is not a, a new concept for, for the city. So as you can see in the next slide, uh, Glasgow circular path is a shared responsibility, which has been mainly driven by the collaboration between Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, Zero Waste Scotland and Glasgow City Council. 
through the policy dialogue we came across, we came across several initiatives such as an urban metabolism analysis that identified the main sectors for the city to become cir circular, such as food and built environment. Also, we, we saw some uh, events on the circular economy to raise awareness. And last year, uh, Glasgow launched its circular economy roadmap, which emphasizes the goal of localizing the circular economy through creating local jobs and promoting community empowerment. This roadmap is the result of the partnership activities, demonstrating the fact that the circular economy is a shared responsibility. Now, uh, Glasgow is working on the organization of the COP26 uh, taking place in November this year, which is an opportunity to show the potential of the city in its transformation uh, and to create also an enduring legacy beyond the conference. So in the last part of my presentation, I will, I will focus on, on the how. Uh, having been working during one year with more than 60 stakeholders in the city, it is clear that there is a strong enthusiasm in having better understanding of, of the opportunities that the circular economy can bring, but there are also some obstac obstacles to, to overcome. For example, uh, in terms of access into funding, uh, available information, uh, in terms of regulation and applying circular economy principles to, to the green public procurement. But, uh, once we have identified these obstacles, we also have started to identify some potential solutions as well, which will be further discussed with all the stakeholders of the city uh, that participated in the, in, in the policy dialogue during a, a, a dedicated policy seminar taking place in, in June this year. Uh, in this policy seminar, stakeholders will discuss the role of the city as a promoter, as a facilitator, as and as an enabler. So as a promoter, it is important to enhance the circular vision to the strategy, but also to make sure that Glasgow can provide a space for, for experimentation. Also, Glasgow can facilitate dialogue with the stakeholders. For example, uh, through initiatives with young people in social and environmental projects that would be related to circular economy activities such as repair, reuse and, and remanufacturing. But also to, be, to make this happen, the city must, make, uh, must put in place all, this, all the enabling conditions in terms of local regulation, economic instruments, capacity building, and also supporting the business se sector, not only focusing on the SMEs, but also focusing on, on, the, on the large corporations. So I, I will conclude here. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention and I'm looking forward to, to the panel discussion now. Thank you, Ander. And uh, this is really a, a perfect example of combining a, a circular economy into a climate objectives. And uh, we continue this study uh, towards the end of the year. And, uh, and as he said, the policy seminars and then uh, some more exchanges with, uh, with the, uh, Glasgow. So um, before moving to the panel, we have one uh, Zoom poll for all the participants. We'd like to hear from you. And uh, uh, yes, you will now see uh, on the screen the question. The, uh, the question is, what are the most prominent sectors that can contribute to reduce CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions? by applying circular principles in cities and regions. Um, do you see the question? Yes. Um, so is it, it's a multiple choice question. Um, Oriana, are we asking, uh, selecting two, two most uh, prominent sectors, right? Exactly. Yes. So please select uh, uh, in your uh, view, two most prominent sectors that can contribute to cut greenhouse gas emissions by applying circular uh, principles. Uh, so result will appear as, as we uh, put uh, uh, your answers. Uh, we wait uh, a little bit more, perhaps uh, 
10, 15 seconds more. Uh, so you see, you see uh, option, food, building and construction, manufacturing, uh, agriculture, transport, energy, waste, water. Um, I hope uh, uh, most of you have uh, already voted. So can we move to the result? Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So building and construction uh, got the most uh, vote, uh, followed by um, transport, food and, and uh, uh, waste are around the same level. Um, and then we see uh, manufacturing, agriculture and energy and water coming. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your participation to the, to the poll. Now um, I'm happy to uh, move on to the uh, panel discussion and I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished guest, um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Anna Richardson, Councillor for uh, Sustainability and Carbon Reduction, City of Glasgow, United Kingdom. Um, we have uh, Ms. Burj Tansar, uh, Head of Circular, Depo Circular Development from ICLE, uh, welcome. Uh, Ms. Patricia Iglesias, uh, President of the uh, Environmental Company of the State of Sao Paulo, welcome. And uh, Mr. Uh, James Pennington, Lead Circular Economy, the World Economic Forum. Um, so welcome, and uh, again, thank you very much for your participation. We are very happy to uh, uh, start the discussion. Um, so the setting I was asked to give uh, you uh, each of you one question, and uh, you have each of you have uh, five minutes to uh, share your views. So I would like to start with Ms. Anna Richardson. Um, Councillor for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction, City of Glasgow. So can you tell us uh, the future plans of Glasgow towards a circular economy to achieve carbon neutrality goals and social uh, well-being? Uh, Anna, welcome again, and then you have a floor. Thank you. Um, thank you for that interesting question. And of course, for all the insightful work that has taken place with the OECD to support Glasgow on our circular journey so far. We are absolutely committed to taking an approach to circularity in Glasgow that embeds social justice as well as sustainability at its core. And I think that came through in the earlier presentation. But our route map lays out exactly what we mean by this. We want circularity that offers opportunities to citizens and to communities to build more resilient local economies, to share, to repair, and to waste less of our resources. And by making circular activities a part of everyday life for them, we'll be able to demonstrate in real terms how climate action is good for their living standards as well. And I'm really excited to see how new ways of working can create space in the city for new local businesses and for third sector organisations. Because those who are already working within our communities will know what those communities need and be able to respond to that most effectively. And I think Professor Webster's comments earlier about supporting these local economies resonated uh, with what we need to achieve here in Glasgow. And we have plenty of successful examples of this happening all over Glasgow on that small scale. We've got organisations that upcycle bicycles. Uh, we have other organisations who are lending tools out to residents so that they can do own, their own work to their homes to improve their energy efficiency, for example. We have organisations that are providing training to local people and repair facilities so that everyday items can be repaired and reused rather than being thrown away. And this is a win-win scenario for all of us because people will make more use of what they already have. But also as a council, we have fewer unwanted items to dispose of. And we need to remember that waste management has a significant financial impact on us as well as a carbon impact. So it's in the city's interests and all of our interests to reduce what we're putting in the bin. So our route map is showing the work that we intend to take forward to make these principles into reality. We've focused on certain areas where we can make a real impact and we're already on our way with some of those actions. 
So we are working with projects to redistribute surplus food, such as through the community fridge model, and as well as food surplus technology from mobile phones to laptops are being repurposed for those who are currently digitally excluded and good access to food and to digital technology, I think, are two areas that were shown um, even more than usual during the pandemic. And we've got a new textile forum that will be launched for the city to help work out how we can reduce wastage in this important sector. Facilitating these networks, bringing people together is an area in which the City Council can add a huge amount of value. We also know that construction is a significant challenge that was mentioned in the, the previous presentation, and we need to get it right if we're to achieve circularity. So we want to work to support it being built into the design of the new buildings that we're seeing in the city, but also harvesting and storing existing materials for reuse. And we intend to show leadership for the city, such as through developing our own procurement processes to support the businesses that are already taking steps in the right direction. And the OECD report highlights that role modelling from organisations such as councils is so important. So we have to make circular practices our own business as usual. And finally, in a year where we continue to deal with the challenges that COVID has brought to our door, as well as looking forward to COP26, we must strengthen our resolve to build better places. We can see that strong communities that have networks and enterprises that could sustain their own neighbourhoods made it through the lockdowns more robustly. So we need to ensure that those same networks enable us to take the right climate action, the action that will support people. So I'm very much hoping that our legacy from COP26 will be one of communities that feel empowered to lead so much of this change themselves towards a healthier decarbonised future. And one in which Glasgow's economy will thrive as we nurture the jobs and businesses that take us closer to our goals of net zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And uh, again, thank you for your participation to the, the, the OECD program and then looking forward to working with you and then the, the stressing the, the social uh, aspect of, uh, of the, the circular economy is quite important and the key, of course, with green, but also circular and then also uh, with the social uh, uh, inclusive, that's a great uh, uh, importance uh, that you have uh, stressed. Thank you very much. Now I would like to move to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Bruchu uh, Tanka. Thank you very much for joining us. And the question for you is what kind of actions and initiatives cities can put in place in the transition to a circular and carbon neutral economy? And uh, can you share with us some examples from your uh, ECLAI members? So the floor is yours, five minutes. Excellent, thank you so much. And uh, well, thanks again for this kind of invitation, Ms. Romano, and for the moderation, Matsumoto-san. It's a quite interesting round. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I am um, leading the circular development area in the ICLA network. For those who may not know ICLA, it's uh, uh, the biggest actually network of local governments um, in the world. Uh, we have 2,500 members and uh, circular development. Uh, you might have recognized we don't say circular economy, circular development because uh, it is uh, also um, the way local development can be um, transformed uh, through circular economy thinking is one of our pathways at, as uh, ICLE. And uh, yeah, we call it a pathway because it's not the ends for us, it's the means uh, to an end. So we talk about, of course, um, at the city level, as we don't have global goals or um, targets um, for material or resource use, we talk about, of course, uh, climate uh, neutrality targets, climate change mitigation plans, um, biodiversity protection, and yeah, local jobs creation, protecting of livelihoods. And uh, indeed, in the last couple of years, circular development has become a key uh, matter and um, leverage point, uh, because we know that um, our time is coming uh, really, um, uh, to an end to reach 1.5 degrees or maybe not two degrees um, world. And uh, yeah, in uh, Glasgow, we'll be talking about really more radical, faster solutions. So uh, in that sense, our network is looking into these bold actions and circular economy or circular development pathway is providing those actions. 
And I like to give um, first uh, one example uh, and then dive into the framework we're using for this. Um, this example comes from the city of Turku uh, in Finland. And Turku is a small town, but they are extremely visionary for a network. Actually, the mayor of Turku, Mayor Arve, is leading the um, circular development pathway in the network. And Turku, um, when they're 800 years old, they like to be climate neutral. That's 2029 not so far away. And the mitigation measures of the city uh, in the climate plan for 2029 has uh, very concrete circularity measures. For example, uh, what was said before, they're looking into all the resource efficiency um, opportunities. So the wastewater treatment plant, for example, collects and treats wastewater coming from 30 in different neighborhoods. And uh, the wastewater heat, is used to um, heat the district, uh, the, uh, for the, produce the district heating and cooling for 15,000 households. Also the sludge from the plant then goes into biogas production, electricity, heating, and transport needs. Uh, but that's not only the urban metabolism that they're looking at, they also look at, uh, of course, the um, resource efficiency in the industry. So the city of Turku, uh, has several subsidiaries like the Turku Science Park Limited, and they look into all the life cycle um, potential environmental improvements uh, in their um, applications, like the textile sector. I think um, one example came from Glasgow. And like Ken Webster mentioned, uh, Turku is also very interested in regenerative solutions. Uh, so it's not only about closing the loop, but it's also how do we balance the city's um, actions. Uh, the industry, the people um, in line with the uh, natural processes. So the regenerative solutions, for example, can be achieved through um, that ICLA has been working with these solutions for many years, uh, decades actually, nature-based solutions. So the number of green areas, maintaining forests, fields, and amount of vegetation in the city, or developing solutions that are nature-based, uh, it directly absorbs carbon. So there's a lot of opportunity in the regenerative aspect of climate, uh, sorry, the circular economy as well. So the, uh, actually I'd like to say uh, that my colleague is posting some links that today is a big, big day for the city of Turku because uh, the city council is uh, approving, hopefully, the circular Turku roadmap. And uh, the roadmap, uh, Ms. R R Romana was asking me, what are the, major fields uh, to intervene and yeah Turku is intervening in this roadmap in food, water, uh, buildings and construction which was uh, I took note of it like almost 60 percent uh, important to our audience it is indeed but also energy transport and logistics. So when the city council approves all these um, we need to see how to put these uh, pilots in place and the policy framework like green public procurement uh, support for the industry, of course, uh, gets very important. So it's not about only actions, but it's also the policy. And those kind of uh, leading cities are part of our European Circular Cities Declaration. Please uh, have a look. You can see lots of examples, and we are grateful that OECD is a partner to this uh, declaration. And if I can use um, some of my time left, I would like to point at the Circular City Actions Framework that we have developed with our um, partners uh, and piloting it 18 cities around the world, not only in Europe. Uh, this city, uh, Circular City Actions Framework is developed with Circle Economy, Ella MacArthur Foundation, Metabolic, and we look into five uh, major strategies. So if a city likes to uh, look into the uh, marriage between circular development and climate mitigation, we would suggest to rethink. So the rethink, uh, the first strategy to start is organizing value chains so that um, the carbon mitigations can be um, achieved in the most uh, systems um, perspective, like Ken Webster was saying. And uh, the Hammerby district in Sweden is like Turku um, applying a closed loop metabolism concept like uh, for water, energy and transportation using the uh, waste um, in order to fuel the uh, district heating and biogas is used to run the local transit, for example. The second is regenerate. So uh, regenerate is, uh, as I said, 
about using the nutrient cycles and ecosystem cycles. And uh, we have a recent example from Bogor in Indonesia, uh, and they use organic waste um, processing uh, through black soldier fly. So the, this fly larva is very interesting, uh, is used in industrial scale, uh, processes the organic waste, and the residue from the process is used as a fertilizer for the urban uh, agriculture. So it has a very regenerative uh, perspective in that sense. Then uh, I want to mention reuse. Reuse is also the um, strategy we heard from Glasgow. How do we really increase the um, life uh, time of the products, the infrastructure, but the products in the city? So, uh, for example, Belo Horizonte is uh, doing that, uh, very similar to Glasgow again. Um, they uh, have set up centers in order to train the citizens even to repair IT equipment and um, they support over 300 digital inclusion sites. So um, obviously reduce and recover are the typical, I think, strategies that we heard of, uh, like the waste management. But um, I would like, I want to especially um, point out the examples more on the systems perspective. Uh, so that's for my five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Burju. And uh, thank you for sharing your initiatives as well as many examples. I see also uh, in the chat uh, function, um, many information and links are shared. So uh, please refer to that. And then I also welcome all participants to uh, use a, a question, a Q and A part, and then put your uh, questions in it so that uh, panelists can can address in their interventions or, or at the discussion if we have enough time. Now uh, the third speaker, uh, Ms. Patricia Iglesias, uh, the president of the environmental company of the state of Sao Paulo. Now we are uh, listening to a, a, a regional example. So the, my question is, uh, uh, what do you think are the major uh, policy instruments uh, for you for in your state uh, to link green and the circular economy. Uh, so can you share with us uh, some examples, Patricia? Yes, thank you, Mr. Tadashi. Uh, first of all, uh, representing the governor of Sao Paulo, Mr. Uh, João Doria, I can say that uh, it's a good pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I would like to thank you, Mrs. Romano, for this opportunity to participate in this event uh, promoted by UOECD. Uh, Sao Paulo, as I think you may know, is the most industrialized state of the country and also one of the most populated. What I'm saying is that we have about 44 million people in the state of Sao Paulo, uh, biggest than um, some countries in the world. So these characteristics of our state present both challenges and opportunities. And for this reason, really, the environmental legislation in Sao Paulo is more restrict than the nation, national environmental legislation for some subjects, and mainly in the pollution area. Uh, and what I can say is that on the other hand, if we look for the investors, uh, they, we see that they recognize that the ESG data can influence uh, the business performance, the corporate strategy, and the risk management in the long term. So some uh, ESG factors, we can say that are quite close to the circular economy like uh, waste management and destination, the reverse logistics, the product responsibility, uh, the life cycle analysis, and uh, the GHG emissions, water shortage, and others. So these elements can summarize what we say that's a circular economy. Uh, at this time, we can say that public policies based on the circular economy will have a decisive 
uh, impacts in the climate neutrality. So they will be very important to the COP in Glasgow also and, and the new initiatives. In the state of Sao Paulo, we have some policies instruments that contribute for uh, pushing the state economy towards a more uh, circular economy. First, we have a robust license process, which is essential, I can say, for assuring pollution control and for promoting the biological cycles, maintenance and resilience. What's our proposal? Second, a, ma a major instrument to boost the circular economy in Sao Paulo is the implementation of our reverse logistics that's quite similar to the extended producer responsibility in European Union. In the state of Sao Paulo, since 2018, we requ require proof of compliance with reverse logistics in environmental license procedures from industries, importers, retailers, and uh, for which implementing this EPR system, this is mandatory by the state legislation. This was very important in our state to assure great engagement of the companies to the reverse logistics. What I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that in 2018, we had about 2,000 companies in the system. Nowadays, we have more than 4,000 companies in the system. So a company cannot get a license to uh, work in the state without uh, do, doing the reverse logistics. Uh, last year also, we elaborate in the company a new regulation for organic waste composting in order to facilitate the implementation of small-scale composting projects for domestic organic waste. Uh, we consider that like 500 kilograms for day, per day uh, sorry, uh, can be facilitated with uh, a simple license system. And this is good for uh, people that want to do the composting. The ideal evolution of the license process aims to encourage the adoption of technologies that are less aggressive to the environment and more efficient in the production process. Uh, the ethanol sector is a, prof, a proof of that also. What I can say is that the sugarcane ethanol is a biofuel with the lowest carbon footprint in the world. And the production of ethanol uh, from beginning to its end has an emission of greenhouse gases 90% lower than gasoline. So uh, today our greener ethanol protocol focuses on improving good practices in soil conservation, reducing uh, both use of ag agriculture supplies and water. What's very important to look for this uh, circular economy. The, technolog the technological innovation in this se sector is very, very important also. So nowadays we uh, have the development of varieties of uh, mechanical cutting uh, that minimize the social impacts of this culture. Uh, research of varieties with great potential for biomass production and greater control in the application of chemicals and concentrate application of vinas. Uh, so I think these are good examples uh, of instruments to combine the green and the circular economy that we can apply here in the state of Sao Paulo. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. It's very interesting and, and uh, particularly the use of, uh, use of regulations uh, uh, is a good example of mainstreaming um, uh, circular economy into, uh, into uh, an economic uh, development planning and, and linking, of course, the, the green and the circular objectives. So thank you very much. Um, now the fourth 
speaker. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Uh, James uh, Pennington, the lead uh, uh, circular economy at the World Economic Forum. So um, our question to you is that uh, the World Economic Forum has been uh, contributing to the climate uh, debate in cities by promoting circular economy in the built environment. Can you tell us more about your initiative and uh, what the next steps are? James, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Matsumoto-san. Real pleasure to be here and thanks to the OECD and all the other, all the other panelists. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, this is such an important issue. Obviously, there are so many very vital transitions that are important to take place within the city. And we've worked on this in a few areas in the past. But today, going back to that survey we had at the beginning of this session, I want to speak a bit more to the built environment, because I do think that when we're talking about decarbonization, this is the key area. So I want to talk about why it's important, um, some of the key circular economy levers, and also what, what the forum's doing and what other partners are, are doing about this and how we can all work on this together. And I think, you know, we have Glasgow presenting excellent, um, excellent uh, examples here, but with also the Glasgow COP on everyone's mind as well. Uh, 2021, we're getting very serious about how we implement the Paris Agreement. And I think, you know, we really have to look into uh, into this. So I'll just post a link. Um, so there's a, you can go to ceclimate.weforum Org. We've put together a micro site which, um, which looks at some of this, these topics around decarbonization and the circular economy. And, um, and, and just to go over this, some of these findings a little bit. So if you look at global emissions, 100% um, of global emissions, 27% of those emissions come from industry. Um, within those 27%, another 60% 6, of those come from four materials, so cement, steel, aluminium, and uh, the broader array of chemicals. Um, these are very hard to abate sectors. There's very unclear decarbonization paths. We can't just install renewable energy. There's, there's, a, there's a hugely complicated path to decarbonizing these areas. Um, the use of these materials, we also see that trending up. So the OECD has predicted that by 2060, material use globally will double. Um, so even if we could easily start to de decarbonize the processes for creating these materials, a lot of that good would still be undone by this rising curve that we see through to 2060. And this could really outpace our decarbonization efforts. So the fact is that we do really need to bring the circular economy to these hard to abate sectors and to these materials. Um, and you know, many of these circular economy solutions un unfold further downstream in the value chain and uh, are much more complex to put forward. So now, if you look at all of those materials I mentioned, um, uh, that you know, circular economy would be very vital, up to say 30% of um, uh, redu reductions from emissions from steel, for instance, would be from circular economy. But also if you look at those materials, almost half of those materials go into the built environment, which of course covers a broad range, but a lot of that is in cities. Um, and also in terms of the built environment, 36% of all waste in Europe comes from the built environment as well. So there's a big waste piece here as well. And um, we're seeing the demand rise at a huge rate. So building stock will need to double by 2050 globally. And there's regional differences here. So Europe, there's a lot of stock there looking at a 20% growth. But if you look at regions like you know, the continent of Africa and the countries there, you're looking at around 66% growth in the built environment. 66% um, uh, uh, sorry, has not been built yet. So really looking to, uh, you know, uh, in most developing countries, a lot of the infrastructure that people will be living in in 2050 hasn't yet been built. So there's a, there's a huge challenge here and a huge opportunity. And um, when you look at the circular economy, there's a few key things which really need to be put in place across the built environment. So first is there's an opportunity to replace building materials with circular alternatives. So that could be low carbon materials. Um, this also could be dematerialization. So high performance materials that can, uh, that can, you know, that, that can replace some of the traditional materials. Um, increasing building utilization. We have a huge demand for floor space going forward. So how can we adapt to repurpose buildings, particularly um, public buildings, and also extend life, uh, renovate the building stock that we already have rather than knocking down and, and starting again. And then of course, recycle and reuse. So using recycled material for new buildings, um, reuse building components, and also use more modular design so that we can replace pieces of buildings and we can also use more recycled materials into those modular designs. 
a, a couple of pieces of work that we're working on I want to point to and a couple of pieces of, uh, of research. So um, uh, firstly, uh, just to point to a, a piece of research which came out recently from the African Circular Economy Alliance, and we work with the AFDB to help host that organization secretariat. Um, it's co-chaired by Rwanda, South Africa and Nigeria. And uh, as I mentioned, across Africa, there's a huge construction boom that's needed. And uh, one area there which came out in this latest report, which is called the five big bets for the circular economy in Africa. Um, you can find that on our website. Um, there's is around the use of timber, um, mass timber in terms of building. And we think this is, you know, has an opportunity everywhere, but there's an interesting piece there where these countries have come together around this. Also, we are, um, we are, uh, so also at the same time, we, um, we're launching an initiative within the World Economic Forum uh, in partnership with the Netherlands government and the Ministry of Environment of Japan and a number of different companies that we're working with called the Circular Economy for Net Zero Industry Transition. We'll be looking at all of these key material streams and how we get to net zero in these material streams, um, including with our first focus being on the built environment. Of course, the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been very foundational for this their report last year on circular economy and climate, but also other organizations we work with. Uh, we're working very closely with the platform for accelerating the circular economy or PACE, who just released a series of um, an action agenda around this on uh, looking at a number of topics and where this can be, where we can make advances on this. They're also pursuing work around metrics for circular economy as well. So there's quite a serious um, you know, group of organizations starting to look at this, but I think you know, the key message really at this stage is that this is incredibly important, um, built environment, the footprint of materials. And we really need to make sure that, you know, everyone working here together can get this on the political agenda. So I think, you know, the COP is important, other, other places we can get this on the agenda is important, in cities this is important. Um, and then also how we can start to really scale some of the partnerships, the business transformations that we need to move this forward. And with that, I'll pass back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Uh, really uh, highlighted the importance of this built environment and also material circulation. It's really important. Miss. I'd like to really pick up your last point, uh, the importance of COP26 and then also partnership with different organizations. And uh, uh, that I think would, would, would fit uh, very well uh, as a wrap up uh, question. And we have uh, only three minutes left. So I would uh, really like to go to ask you this last question um, about uh, the, you know, the road to the COP26. So how uh, the, this question goes to everyone and if you could uh, give us uh, your view and then answer in, let's say one minute each. So the question would be how, how to further raise uh, the, the, the profile of local action, uh, cities and regional action in the circular economy towards the COP26. So I would like to uh, perhaps uh, start with Anna, if uh, possible, as a host uh, city. I think the, the most exciting thing about COP26 uh, coming to our city is it's an opportunity for everybody to speak about these issues that are so important to all of us who are here today, but to take it into that wider context. And I think it's so important that we never talk about circular processes without speaking about the people that are at the heart of that work, eh, whether it's those who are taking up new greener jobs, eh, whether they're um, within communities saving some money or having better services because eh, of, of these great new circular initiatives, um, just having easier access to better quality of life within their own communities while reducing um, all of our environmental impact. I think that's a fabulous story to tell and I think having COP26 gives us a chance to talk about eh, that, that impact that it has on people because I think the circular economy is very much built on the simple actions of communities looking after one another, eh, as much as it's about new technology or changes to manufacturing. And if we keep that in mind, and if we keep storytelling at the heart eh, of everything that we do around COP26, I think we have a really great opportunity eh, to bring people with us on this in a way that perhaps we've, we've never had that opportunity before. Great, Anna, thank you very much. Uh, Burju? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, joining Anna's uh, message, obviously, um, it's very clear, I think, for our members that it's not enough just to look into renewable energy or energy efficiency measures. That's only 55% of the materials. 
that uh, also I think James mentioned, we need to now tackle that 45% in everything, you know, we eat, we, um, how we travel, how we live in our homes and uh, buildings and the infrastructure we build to move. Um, and yeah, cities play a great role for that. It's, uh, it's through their purchasing practices, but also uh, through supporting enterprises and empowering citizens. And how we are working on that is actually already a very concrete tip. I would like to give just um, send a link on that. Uh, ICLEI leads the um, human settlements uh, pathway of the climate action pathways of UNFCCC together with UNAP. And we have a window of opportunity there to really inspire the negotiators on what actions need to be taken toward 2030, 40 and 50. And uh, there we need to go for zero waste cities. We need to go for 1.5 degree lifestyles and as Anna said, uh, equitable living. So access for all uh, and particip through participatory processes. Uh, many messages, but I think um, we are very much in line. Thank you again. Thank you, Virtue. Now, uh, Patricia. Yes, uh, what I think is that we can remember about the SDG 17 and the importance yeah. of the partnerships, the partnerships for the circular economy. So in my opinion, the local governments, the subnational governments has an important task. We have nowadays an environmental agreement to put together not only the public sector, but also the private sector to work together. It's a mm -hmm. voluntary protocol and the, the state can help the private sector giving methodology to report the, the GHG uh, reductions, uh, emission reductions. So the idea is that we have to improve this. We have to, to see how the local governments can do something uh, working together with the private sector. And this is much more important for us in Brazil, I can say, because all of you are looking and seeing what we have in the federal level here. So uh, in, for our country, it's very, very important to work in the local level and in the state level. And I think we can contribute to uh, the um, Paris Agreement uh, with our local level work. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And not but uh, not least, uh, uh, James. Yeah, no, um, I think you know a lot of the of my other panelists have really summed this up. I love the Glasgow point. Community initiatives. People need to be involved and really see the value of this as well. Um, partnerships, you know, I'd add to that, um, you know, the, the, the companies which are using materials, the companies which are producing materials, they need to work together, you know, people demolishing buildings, people building buildings, designing buildings, but also the public sector and the private sector. And of course, at the city level and the national level, there's a role for policy. So firstly, to, you know, examine policies that stand and make sure that we're incentivizing the right thing. Professor Webster really spoke to this in a very eloquent way. Um, and also looking at the incentives that are in place and also looking at procurement as a major a major lever as well. And I think the final thing as well is we don't see really, uh, even at this stage, many countries with circular economy written into their NDCs. I believe uh, there's one, maybe, maybe one or two. So I think there's this communication between cities and national policymakers about how cities are lowering emissions through circular economy and how that can be put into countries' NDCs and how that can be spread globally would be the final piece on that. Indeed, thank you very much, James. And uh, I think uh, this wraps up very well. And uh, starting with Professor website, uh, uh, the systems uh, and then uh, connection and, and uh, exchange, which is also uh, nicely uh, linked with uh, the, your last uh, closing words, like partnership, people-centered, um, and, uh, and networks and so on. So it was very, uh, coherent message I think was uh, was uh, was found uh, in, uh, in this session I think so thank you very much uh, to all the panelists and all the participants this brings us to the end of today's uh, session um, and please stay tuned uh, for tomorrow's sessions 
on going from global to local, uh, closing loops in green recovery plans and uh, measuring progress in cities and regions. Also, please uh, uh, keep our conversation going on social media uh, with the uh, OECD local and uh, hashtag circular economy. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. So thank you very much. This closes this session. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. And thank you for the panelists. It was a great session, I believe. <laughs>